And welcome back to Think Tech. This is Global Connections. And uh, our show today is all about whether the United States is safe from Middle Eastern terrorism, or putting it broadly from terrorism. Is terrorism in the United States likely, or could it be inevitable? Our guest to discuss this subject is Rupmati Khandakar. Uh, she's a global thinker and a strategic analyst, okay? And um, let, me, let me introduce the subject this way. So we have had several generations of hate in the Middle East. And uh, Islam has developed a, a lot of uh, groups that are terrorist in nature. And there are, there are people, in fact, there are state actors that, that use terrorism, uh, like they use uh, proxies in, in war uh, for their own purposes. And every time you look, there is more terrorism, better armed, better directed by rogue states like Iran. Uh, and we have to get a handle on this. Um, but you know what? They could get into this country. And there are already people in this country who are so angry and so, what do I say, motivated, radicalized, that that's a great concern. It's happening in Europe and it's happening elsewhere in the world. Terrorism is a, is a sign of our times. Uh, and I suppose you could say it's happening in Russia or from Russia, because every, every day I, I read Medusa and I find out that Mr. Putin is doing more assassinations inside of Russia and outside of Russia. And uh, he, he's denying responsibility, but we know better. So uh, is that terrorism? And is that terrorism that's extra, extra territorial? Uh, and of course, we have to look at uh, Mr. Trump because he gives license to violence, uh, even judges, prosecutors, and jurors, and likes to create chaos. Is, is that domestic terrorism? to or could it get to be domestic terrorism? So here we are, Rupati Khandakar, and I put the question to you first, welcome to the show, but second, is the United States safe from Middle Eastern terrorism? What do you think? Hello, Ajay. Thank you for having me on such a relevant topic and always a pleasure to be with you. So, Jay, <laughs> U.S. is not immune to uh, terrorist threats from its conflicts in the Middle East. Now, the proximity is, the distance is huge, but the terror, um, the possibility is so near for all, all of us, it just can't be underestimated, Jay, and that's what we're going to discuss today, that, uh, you know, it's in the news. Uh, latest that San Francisco uh, airport was shut down because of uh, Gaza protesters. So uh, you see something which is happening across the land and sea is affecting uh, U.S. Uh, act, uh, life. And that's what makes Middle East politics so relevant to uh, America. And Jay, terrorism is something, uh, as the name suggests, we still don't have a definition for terrorism in international politics. Because one man's freedom is one man's terrorism. That is the uh, thing that they uh, jumble around with. And they don't have a set definition for terrorism, even, be, even though it brings about a loss of life and property and everything. It, they don't have a definition of terrorism. So terrorism just stays to the point of creating terror or creating havoc in people's lives. And America as a country, Jay, we know it's a gravitating pot for immigrants. Immigrants who have come for economic prospects, the nationalism, the patriotism for a country which is a relatively a new country in uh, uh, human civilizations. It has just existed for uh, a few year, uh, 200, a uh, couple of decades, but uh, we have these civilizations which have gone for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. So uh, you see, Jay, loyalty comes to fourth. that how much patriotism do you have for the country? Uh, how much will you give up for the country? How much will you protect the country? That comes into question at every point when we have these porous borders. How much do you protect America as a land of your own? Is a big question when you have migrants who have come in and settled. When you treat the land as your own, it's very fine. I agree on that. But when you have, uh, uh, you know, Middle Eastern politics, now, Jay, it's a little bit technical because Islam is one of the only religions who has a political roadmap. 
Now, the political roadmap is a three stage uh, uh, this they have that it is first uh, Darul Aman, that is a land of peace where you where you just go and you cannot do anything, you maintain peace and calm. So that is the first stage. And uh, the second stage is Dalul Harab, that is land of conflict, where you think that you can establish yourself. You struggle and you try to establish, that is the movement and uh, the dynamic uh, stage. And second, third one is Darul Islam, where the entire world is uh, a land of Islam. So that is the ultimate goal, to transform it into Islam, where it would be, uh, now these concepts, Jay, are very technical because in the Islamic world, there are two categories of human beings, fidels and infidels. So uh, you don't have a, a, a gray zone. It's a black and white. You're my friend or you're my enemy. That makes it more dangerous. And uh, whether they say it or not, jihad is a violent uh, struggle for your means. So that brings about uh, using uh, means to achieve your ends which have no moral standing and that becomes a problem Jay. because see Middle East uh, is a zone where uh, the US has maintained relations with all 18 uh, nations except for two Iran and Syria otherwise the uh, United States has got diplomatic relations with all of them and Jay we see with the frequent visits of the president the Secretary of State, the various delegations that go in, they do go to mediate between conflicts, they do go to uh, uh, um, diffuse escalating tensions time and again. They, they have allies, they do have, uh, you know, their stance on international conflicts, but all of that has an effect on domestic. Because when these frustrations and indoctrinations enter US borders, uh, terrorism is very easy to uh, execute J. You can't have lines of defense against terrorism. If a suicide bomber is coming, how many lines will you put in front of him? You know, he will cross, another one will cross. So, protecting your subways, protecting your uh, roads from terrorism becomes all the more difficult because your uh, scope is so widened, while for the terrorists, the target is clear. One car, one bomb, one uh, building. Now the Twin Towers were symbols of free trade, liberal uh, world, everything. They were brought down in two seconds, two, two flights. And uh, you remember, Jay, the person who had come to uh, uh, learn uh, flying for uh, uh, during the 9-11, the flying school told him, we can't teach you uh, takeoff and landing in this much time. We may only be able to teach you the takeoff. And he said, that's all I need. <laughs> so they are so clear cut in their uh, approach to... Uh, Terrorism and defending against terrorism becomes a big task because we are in, living in a land of liberty. So, you know, that, it's, that it's, it's, it's very hard to, you know, screen it. As you said, you could make yeah. a layer to a protection, but it may not be enough. And so if we're talking about people trying to enter the country doing terrorism, isn't that hard to do that? You know, you can you can get somebody and you can radicalize that person. And you can get them into the country so easily. I am reminded of a, of, a, of a whole new thread of YouTube videos that I've seen pop up on my screen about uh, people smuggling, smuggling cigarettes, contraband, uh, uh, animal skins, even weapons uh, through airports. And, you know, the police in Europe, they catch them one way or the other. And, and they, um, you know, either they, they confiscate or they send them out home or or even, you know, detain them and prosecute them. But hmm, that's that's something visible. Um, you don't need to carry anything into the country except an idea, a mission, yes. a determination. Exactly. To be a terrorist from outside. And then you, you know, you meet up with other people who will help you and you collaborate um, to do terrorism. But you can get through the airport pretty easily unless you have a, you know, a visible record of having participated in, in terror overseas. So I think you know, it's entirely possible that people can come into this country with the notion, with the intention of doing terrorism, and we don't have a way to stop them. I'd go a step further and say, 
if you, if you ask Homeland Security right now uh, for a list or even a number of all the people in the country and on what kind of visa, they wouldn't have that. It's not just the southern border. It's, this has been the case for decades. They don't have it with all of the AI and, and data processing uh, competence we may have in Silicon Valley. We can't give you that list. We have no idea who's here, who's here legally, who's here illegally. So the point is you could have a whole gang of terrorists here and the government really not necessarily would not know about it. The FBI claims to know who's here and they claim to be following people who are risks. I'm not sure that's true. Uh, I don't, I, you know, we, and, and furthermore, we have the constitutional protections. We can't do the kind of investigation uh, that maybe would help that Mr. Putin would do. So um, I think that entirely possible, if not inevitable, um, that people would come from outside and do that. And they would find weapons and friends here in the United States. It's only a question of time before somebody does that. So the question I, I ask you is, are they motivated? Is it that Iran would send somebody? Is it that Hamas or Hezbollah uh, or the Houthis would send, send somebody to the United States in order to do terror? Jay, if Bin Laden from the Tarabura Mountains could send uh, his uh, guys to uh, the American soil, it, these these people are trained. They have uh, the mercenaries who will give up their lives, who are indoctrinated, and uh, who have a frustration against uh, um, America, Jay. And for them, advertising a terrorist attack is more important than anything else. We have learned it in the Israel-Hamas war that the October 7th attack was the advertisement that all the advertisement that Hamas needed. So uh, this kind of uh, show and tell that they have, the blitz that they want to create is only possible when they send these sniper targeted uh, uh, attacks through uh, American borders. And Jay, uh, Iran has, uh, Iran is, doesn't have relations with uh, America since 1980 when, 79 when they, bought, they took over the embassy in uh, the US or, you know, Syria has, you, you know, we always talk about this frustrations and indoctrination because mindset plays a very important role in terrorism. That power to execute has to come through very uh, deep throated uh, frustration. And that's what happens when uh, you have these countries and the language that they use is of constant um, domination, uh, that the U.S. presents itself as. But J U.S. has never, ever uh, done something to go and frustrate them to an extent that they come across this lands and create this. We always wanted to solve it within the Middle East. But the spilling out of uh, effects is because, you know, uh, they simply don't care about human life. The destruction that they, that entails after the 9-11 towers, we're still talking about it, 2001. So well, how, how attractive is how attractive is the U.S. as a target for terrorism? Um, you know, for terrorism such as you see on the streets of the West Bank and terrorism such as we saw in 9-11 and terrorism in terms of, uh, you know, destroying institutions, uh, buildings, government, uh, you know, offices and the like. Um, how attractive is it to a terrorist, uh, say in Hamas, Hezbollah, um, or the Houthis, um, to you know come to the United States and blow something up? Are we more attractive than targets in the Middle East? And what what would be achieved exactly? Attractive is the right word, Jay, because there is a lot of liberty and uh, fraternity that uh, goes around in America, and that's what helps them. So. Uh, that liberty that they can take to come in, enter, establish themselves, and attack uh, uh, symbols with liberty is the point. We don't have restrictions. If it was an authoritarian, totalitarian country, Jay, these people would be crushed. At uh, We don't have a shoot at sight. There was an incident a few days back that the New York police was overwhelmed. NYPD was overwhelmed by the... A uh, mob of uh, migrants now, amongst those migrants who are being transported by school buses to hotels, to schools, 
uh, how many of them are being screened, like you said? How many of them are being, how do we know their background? You remember one we had spoken about that he was a head of an Algerian terrorist outfit. He walked in, he walked in. The porous boundaries uh, are uh, giving us a wage. And uh, once they get into the fabric of the society, it will be more and more difficult for them. And these people exactly use the tenet of liberty to attack democratic Americans. You know, I'm reminded of, um, uh, you know, we should not limit this conversation uh, to uh, Hamas or Hezbollah or the Houthis. Yes. Uh, fact is, we have Mr. Putin himself, who is an expert at uh, deniable assassinations. Uh, nearly every day, if you read Medusa, which is a bunch of uh, journalists who had to leave Russia and live and write in Lithuania, Latvia, you know, the Baltics, um, they report on assassinations and attempted assassinations, attacks that somehow magically happen against people who speak out against Putin. Um, and, you know, it's uh, the last one was a hammer attack, just like Nancy Pelosi's husband a couple of years ago. Uh, mm -hmm. where somebody stopped him on the street and began attacking him by bringing a hammer to his head. Um, and I, he lived, but he was a friend of Navalny's. He was, a, you know, a supporter of Navalny's, and he spoke out against Putin, and that was his, his reward. So all I'm saying is that Mr. Putin can seem to assassinate, poison, cause attacks to be made against anyone who speaks against him, but he could also be in this country, couldn't he? Um, he could have somebody come in this country and go to a, uh, gee, go to a hardware store and come up with a weapon that could be lethal. Uh, don't even have to have a gun. And, you know, I'm thinking that um, that's just as likely in terms of the, you know, the, the sordid possibilities uh, that we could have uh, some, a terror assassination, if you will, organized by Vladimir Putin. What do you think? Jay, he's got access every which way uh, in any place he's going, because right now, after the March 7, 15th election, he's going to be uh, head of state till 2036. And uh, Jay, they work in underhand dealings because that is, uh, uh, that is much easier for them, isn't it? Rather than organized, uh, simply the efficiency of the attack, the strike rate of the attack would be much higher when they have uh, uh, this one-on-one -on -one coming for poisoning, for uh, assassinations, for anything like this. Putin is very, very sharp in this uh, kind of uh, warfare because uh, that keeps him, um, he's a spy. We don't, we need to forget, he's trained, uh, he's excelled in this kind of uh, activity from the beginning this underhand dealings that they do, they know what they're uh, approaching. And Jake, conventional um, warfare and terrorism are di uh, completely opposite. And they mm -hmm. work against um, each other in absolute efficiency, Jake. Like a uh, terror attack would destroy the most powerful military setup ever with one suicide bomb or, you know, one targeted attack or one assassination. So yeah. this symmetrical uh, balance is very real. Well, inherent in terrorism is terror, as you say. And mm -hmm. it seems to me that the United States right now is on a trajectory to an election in November, which is, what, seven months away. Um, and, um, and in terms of the, what motivates people to organize terrorism and to do terrorism here in this country uh, is somehow connected, don't you think, to the fact that that election is coming. We are involved, you know, in the ninth inning of our long, long, you know, campaign here between Biden and Trump and others, many others running for Congress. Um, and, and so it seems to me that the risk somehow is increased as we get closer to that election. That is, yes. that somebody organizing terror would have a greater motivation um, to, you know, change the nature of the of, of public opinion and the election, uh, the vote, uh, as we get closer. What do you think? Yeah, Jay, uh, you're very right. This uh, 
election timings are more chaotic, more uh, they have more approachable uh, points that they can come forward to. Uh, like just to give a reference point, when Afghanistan was attacked in the 80s and uh, the attack in uh, America happened in 2001. So this frame, time frame that they need for their frustrations to take place, Jay, is the time zone that we're looking at. We don't know when they will strike and what they will do. And you know, Jay, uh, the vulnerability of America is that uh, the entire, uh, what is that, the scope that the terrorists have, anywhere it can be, street, um, your subway, your, uh, your office, your building, your airport, your anywhere. They don't have a limit to that. How many things can we protect is the question, Jay. And citizens coming forward to help, uh, that creates the exact thing that they're looking for. They're going for terrorism and it's going to create that fear, that terror. You know, we, we have um, talk of uh, arms being restricted. Trump comes up with one point. Biden comes up with one point. But Jay, we have spoken about this in one, a few uh, in our programs that personal security becomes the issue at the end of the day. How much can you protect it when it comes to your own zone? Uh, what is your line of personal protection is, com becomes the line. And uh, when the terrorist comes to your door, how much can you protect? Then state apparatus, uh, your defense goes a little bit step further. Yeah. You know, we haven't we haven't talked about cyber terrorism and cyber terror. You don't have to you don't have to come through an airport. You don't have to bring in weapons. Um, you don't even have to organize a, a terror group in this country. All you have to do is um, you know do electronic cyber terrorism, and you can do that from anywhere in the world, anywhere, and it can be bringing down a power plant, bringing down some critical infrastructure. Uh, and, you know, uh, although we haven't seen it, uh, it's clear that you could bring things down so as to injure people, kill people, and destroy cities uh, simply by doing cyber terrorism. Um, you know, to me, that's a great risk. And it's like there's a, a war of deterrence going on. What I mean is maybe the Russians are not going to do that because they know that we would try to do it to them. So we deter each other. But, but the possibility exists that with modern technology and software and telecommunications, um, the Russians could hit significant institutions and industrial, um, you know, industrial organizations in our country uh, without, even, without even leaving Moscow. What do you think? Is that, is that a greater risk or a lesser risk of terrorism from afar? No, Jay, you're right about this, uh, that, you know, it becomes um, all the more easy for these people to attack power grids, your uh, systems, your uh, surveillance systems, everything from a distance. Cyber, cyber terrorism is a, a huge risk today in an interconnected uh, web world. And uh, Jay, uh, Russia and America both are capable of, uh, in you know, cyber, tackling cyber terrorism. But Jay, I'll tell you, Russia will never go head on. It will always use a proxy rogue state that we have. And uh, they pay they pay to do their dirty work. Uh, that becomes the problem, Jay. We cannot deal <laughs> directly with uh, Russia because they always have proxies. We never know who is the proxy. Like how Iran is the proxy in this uh, war. Russia has always used proxies. So um that is one thing to trace the origin of the cyber terrorism also becomes a big task and uh yeah, yeah. a deniability you know they yes. want to have deniability so they separate themselves um, but we know who's running the internet research agency in moscow we know that we can put yes. two to two two to two together uh, let me let me also bring the, the china into this china is very good at cyber terrorism yes. it's very good at insinuating um, you know, uh, 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 internet elements into our society that, that could be activated. Now, for example, there was a piece on 60 Minutes uh, not too long ago about how um, the Chinese were one of the largest crane makers, crane, you know, construction cranes in the world. Uh, I don't know why we aren't, you know, we, we have the steel, we used to have the steel. Now Japan is trying to buy U.S. steel, if you haven't seen that. 
So, but you know, China has lots of steel and China builds cranes. And so, um, and this is not only limited to cranes, but uh, there was a suggestion that China was building cranes that are automated, right? With your cell phone, you could operate a crane that's hundreds of feet tall of you know, thousands of tons of steel uh, in a shipyard, a moving cargo. And uh, likewise, if, if there's some, you know, something was insinuated into the software, um, somebody with a cell phone uh, could deactivate the crane or crash the crane or let the crane fall over in a shipyard. So one fellow walking around with a cell phone could stop trade in the port of Los Angeles. Now that's terrorism, it's cyber terrorism. And, yes. the, and, the China, and the Chinese have been delivering cranes to, uh, to all of our ports. And we just, we, we don't check up on that and we don't know. Um, so, you know, you, you know it's, not, it's no point of being, uh, you know, uh, paranoid about it. But at the same time, I think we have to make sure that we are building them ourselves, that we are checking out the software and the control mechanisms and making sure that nobody can do that to us. But you know, I, I don't think that China should be written off this discussion. China is capable of doing it. And there's a certain indication that it's, it's sort of a sleeper cyber terrorism that China is doing or can do or would do. I think we have to be careful about that possibility. Your thoughts? What a relevant point, Jay, what a relevant point. China is uh, almost a superpower in this kind of uh, control that they have. And everything was made in China for the past few decades. So they have uh, reached every uh, home, every appliance, every uh, television set, every screen, everything they have reached. And Jay, uh, how can we forget biological terrorism, which we went through COVID? Uh, it was uh, uh, one phase that they brought in that they could control the entire world with such a one virus. So uh, uh, one laptop or one, uh, computer system or one biological weapon or you know you have this kind of um, mechanisms which with they can target and enter your system is the terrorism that we are scared of or we are wary of and Jay when they come in the destruction may be uh, you know, we can cover up later on the compensation will 100% be there we will recover from it but the impact that it has is the uh, issue Jay the impact of the curtailment of liberty, how many checks we had to go through, airports for or after 9-11 uh, was the issue. How many uh, uh, restrictions, how many, uh, you know, eyes would look if you found a suspicious, uh, the, the ease of mind was destroyed after a terrorist attack. That is what uh, is the most important part. The worry, the terror, the, the thought process that comes in after terrorism, is the uh, vital point during these things today? Yeah, I want to, before we're before we're done here, I want to turn to domestic terrorism for a moment. You know, I mean, sometimes you have people come from other countries and they're in the domestic fabric, or they have become domestic and they're you know they're sympathetic to outside interests that, that would like to damage the United States. But we have people who are very disenchanted about this country. Um, you know, uh, Donald Trump encourages disenchantment. He encourages, uh, you know, uh, uh, people who don't trust the government, who don't trust the country, who are just unhappy people and who, you know, would be fertile ground uh, for terrorism, to, to be terrorists uh, on a domestic uh, basis. I mean, Timothy McVeigh blowing up the Oklahoma federal building years ago. You know, he, he had his reasons, but he was an American as, as apple pie. Uh, and that was domestic terrorism. So, you know, I think we have to consider that here. Um, you, have, you have people all over the country in the campuses who have not only rallied against Israel and expressed anti-Semitism, but who have rallied for Hamas. And, you know, in through that crowd, there would be people who are essentially sympathetic with Hamas, which is a terrorist organization. How far are they from becoming domestic terrorists, whether they were born here, whether they came here or not, doesn't matter. Um, they're really against 
Um, they're, they're, they're motivated by hate and they're against American institutions and American values. And uh, it seems to me that we have a problem that is more serious now than it was, uh, say, a decade ago, because we have more guns in the country. We have more people like the Oath Keepers and the Proud Boys and uh, those who participated in the, uh, uh, the January 6th uh, insurrection. For my money, and, and I'm not the first one to call them this, they're domestic terrorists, and they can strike any time. And we really haven't, you know, within constitutional limits, we haven't been able to really identify all the risks and deal with them. What are your thoughts about domestic terrorism coming to and expressing itself in the United States? So point on J, domestic terrorism becomes an uh, issue because the frustrations that came out in, in the conflict that is happening in the Middle East was so rampant. The protest marches that happened were so visible and they were so uh, um, forceful, if I use the word, because the vengeance that they, they display was something more than that would be displayed in the Middle East itself. Uh, it was on American soil. And Jay, this is out of uh, their willingness. Imagine if they were offered money for it. Imagine if they were offered, offered incentives to uh, destroy institutions, if they felt that something would be, they would achieve if they had destroyed, if they destroy institutions. Now the San Francisco airport being shut down, like we said in the beginning of this, uh, that is to abuse domestic uh, uh, routine. And that becomes a problem, Jay, because something that is happening in the Middle East is still affect, affecting American domestic areas. And like, like you say, domestic terrorists or domestic mindsets, they come out of uh, very acute frustrations, acute um, their, their inability to understand that what is happening over there is nothing to do with now, nothing to do with here. And they, if they want to do anything about it, they should go and fight the front line in the Middle East rather than put it over here. Uh, on Where they enjoy the tenets of democracy, Jay. Don't forget that all these people, they live in a democratic state. They uh, enjoy a democratic life, but they want to destroy the very institutions of democracy, the state apparatus, the police, the everything protects your democracy. And domestic terrorists always attack these uh, uh, symbols that's well you know we have we have mr trump who encourages chaos he yes. encourages <laughs> dissension and division i mean any any good autocrat or would-be autocrat you know will do that in order to enhance his own power um and so he, here he's running and it's possible that he'll become president again and and an unrestrained president he'll do more of that than he has been doing. That's one possibility. And the other possibility is Joe Biden, who is sort of straddles the issues in the Middle East. And for that matter, he straddles the issues uh, in Ukraine also, um, where he sort of plays both sides of the fence in, in various ways. So my question to you, this is not an easy question, Ramadi. Are you ready for a difficult question? You know, I after all, you're a, a global uh, geopolitical strategist. So um, I want to ask you a question like this. <clears throat> is it riskier in this very porous country in which we live? And, not, and that porousness is not limited to the borders. It's porous, as we have discussed, in so many other ways. In this very porous country, uh, is it more likely that we will, this is a hard question, more likely that, that we will see domestic terrorism or terrorism, whether from the outside or the inside, more likely under a Biden administration next time round or a Trump administration next time round, which is riskier in terms of our defenses uh, to terrorism, both foreign and, and domestic, and to our, 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 our vulnerability to it? <laughs> That's a very difficult question because we are in a phase of change, Jay, right now. Biden. Biden's policies uh, are very slow and understanding, and uh, Trump will come up with a uh, display of show and tell of patriotism and the Abraham Accords, and you know he he being the savior, messiah of all the problems of the world, uh, throwing out uh, climate change, throwing out the UN, throwing out NATO. 
and he will create peace. He claims to be the only president who has never had any war uh, in his time. He's crossed the North Korea uh, border. Yeah, he's, a sh he's literally made for the television screen. Uh, you know, he is really show and tell. And Biden has been doing this process, domestic uh, violence. And, you know, I don't know what the MAGA will come up with, with the euphoria that they will have if they have a possible victory is one of the things that everybody has to keep about. The clashes which happened <laughs> were reminiscent of the civil war when the red and the blue fought. Uh, so uh, that kind of phase comes in when you have these affinities and you know you have these loyalties tearing you apart between the red and blue. Uh, what we need, really need right now in America is harmony within domestic area to be able to fight external pressures and terrorism. We don't need a divided America to uh, and, uh, to withstand uh, terrorism. That is so vital, whether Biden, whether Trump, you know, there has to be unity in uh, American politics and uh, uh, the so civil society. There doesn't have to be a civil war at all amongst them. No, you know, you, you refer uh, to uh, to Trump. Uh, if, if he loses, um, we might have another insurrection. Um, yes. So that that changes the calculus, I think. Uh, if he, if if um, the people who vote for Biden, you know, cause Biden to win, that doesn't mean that um, Biden will be, uh, you know, unopposed by Trump in, in another insurrection. Doesn't have to be exactly the same kind, but it would be an insurrection because that's what he does. He that's what he does. He he doesn't accept succession of power, um, mm. and so if that happens, that sort of changes the the odds, doesn't it? Uh, so it means that if if uh, whatever happens in this election, either way, um, there might be an insurrection here, or at least uh, a, a a vulnerability um, to to violence and to what I would consider domestic terrorism. But I have one more one more question for you, Rubati. Okay? Uh, this is in a way more difficult. Let's get practical. Let's roll up our sleeves. Um, I'm, I'm going to make you advisor to the White House today, okay? Um, which I think you should be. Um, and, the, and, the, and the question is, uh, what do we do? What do you advise the administration to do in this very porous country uh, with not only porous borders, but porous airports and a porous, you know, society? Uh, what do we do to protect ourselves and to deal with people who would do do us harm uh, on on a terrorist basis? Um, what organizations would you bring to bear? Uh, what law enforcement would you would you enhance? What steps would you take to protect us in this this constitutional society we have, where people have rights and you can't just throw them in jail? Uh, you have to investigate in a way that's consistent with due process. Uh, what would you do? This is a hard question. I must say, Rupani, this is harder than the previous question. Yes. What's, your, what's your answer <laughs> to that? <laughs> Jay, we are in a transitional phase right now, total transition, and the anti-incumbency factor against uh, Mr. Biden is so high right now that we don't know what it is exactly going to happen. Uh, if America had to go for it, we needed to strengthen the police departments in every state. The, uh, they should be given, you know, they are given a bad name through one killing or one, you know, the racist uh, uh, coloring that the police department has. It's not true. They do protect uh, us in daily lives. Uh, that the institutions, the security institutions have to be strengthened. Uh, the civil liberties which we have, they will have to be curtailed, Jay, because at risk is the entire American population. Uh, you know, Jay, any uh, society which is as liberal as the American society, it's difficult to say that it will have the same liberties as before because another terrorist attack will just curtail everything. So before that, pre that, there should be a little bit of, you know, raising of the screenings. The, my, the borders have to be, you know, uh, not this porous that is happening. You know, you have AOC and everybody coming up saying, you know, help the migrants. Uh, you know, that kind of um, woke talk has to be curtailed. 
in uh, american security and american national nationalism has to be put to forefront because to screen these people terrorism is a very personal uh, contribution that happens of every citizen only then terrorism can be tackled because terrorism itself is a very personal affair when they take it to the personal vendetta then terrorism happens so protection against terrorism comes to a point where there is your personal investment in it when you are ready to give up part of your freedom when a citizen is ready to come up with the means to be aware uh, means to help the government and the government and the citizens work hand in hand and like we said unity between uh, america has to be at the forefront nationalism patriotism for your country has to be at the forefront it's a land of gravitating immig uh, it's a gravitating land of immigrants but it has to be a country which loves the american soil yeah uh, i hope we can get back to that to be the next uh, greatest generation i got one one more thing that you that you touched on that i want to ask you about rupati you know there are many people that say well all you have to do if you want peace in the world and you want to cut off the possibility of terrorism it's simple you get rid of netanyahu and <laughs> you have a, and you have a two state solution and everybody will be happy and there will be peace in the land and thus uh, you know at least from foreign sources there'll be peace you know they'll they'll be uh, less likely to have foreign terrorism come to the united states what are your thoughts about that is that is that likely to solve this problem <laughs> my point of view that let netanyahu get rid of hamas which will solve the problem properly <laughs> <laughs> and and how about the two state solution? I mean, there, you know, the, the Biden administration is pushing that, and I'm I'm saying, is that really a solution? Is that is that a practical solution for it. Israel they or for us? They really don't deserve it because Gaza was given as an independent property completely. They were free to do what they want. They built tunnels. They built tunnels to attack Israel on the fateful day of uh, October seventh. They chose that. The liberty that they have, they chose it to create terror in Israel on October seven. So, can we risk it again? Can we risk another attack? No. no. Emphatically, no. Yeah. Okay. I'm <laughs> I'm with you, Rubadi, Rubadi <laughs> Kandakar, a geopolitical strategist that really helps us out to understand what is going on there and also here in the United States. Thank you so much, Rubadi. Thank you so much. Hello, Hajj. Hello, If you liked this show, why don't you give us a like or subscribe to our channel? Thanks so much.